All right, hello. So, what is Romanticism? This has been a controversial question for at least 200 years. Um, today I'm going to look at Arthur Lovejoy's attempt to deal with it. So, who was Arthur Lovejoy? He was a founder, so worked mainly in the early and mid 20th century, founder of the discipline known as the history of ideas. Many other scholars have used this method, but Lovejoy remains, still remains, one of the great historians of ideas. Uh, as a student, he studied under William James and Josiah Royce, who I've talked about in other videos. That was for at Harvard for his uh, master's degree. He never actually got a PhD, which is interesting. Um, and he founded the History of Ideas Club at Johns Hopkins University, where I think he taught for uh, his main, the main part of his career. And I like this description of Lovejoy by one of his students, which also gives the impression of reading, of actually reading Lovejoy. So his student, uh, his student wrote, Lovejoy sat at the head of the table, his bushy hair almost all gray, with a white mustache and imperial, his eyes alert, occasionally squinting as if from too much reading. His voice was gruff and low, even monotonous, speaking in long, interminable paragraphs, with parentheses within parentheses and brackets for digression, a bit haltingly to accommodate the semicolons, all the while twirling his cigarette holder to ease the strain and to replace the intellectual fog with a more congenial smoke. So, a very evocative description of Lovejoy. And Lovejoy wrote about Romanticism in a number of essays. Probably these are the most important on the discrimination of Romanticism, uh, Romanticisms. Uh, the, uh, chapter 10 of The Great Chain of Being, his uh, probably most famous book, and The Meaning of Romanticism for the Historian of Ideas, a later essay. His thesis in the first essay, Discrimination on the Discrimination of Romanticisms, is one that many later scholars have tried to refute. So that's a, it's an important one to know about. But first, I should say a little bit about Lovejoy's method, how he goes about working, since that also is, has been influential and important. So the first part is about finding the important terms or concepts. So after the scholar has chosen his texts, uh, and Lovejoy, of course, was writing in the early 20th century, so he uses the masculine pronoun. So after the researcher, the scholar, has chosen his te texts, the first task of the historiographer of ideas is a task of logical analysis. The discrimination in the texts and the segregating out of the texts of each of what I shall call the basic or germinal ideas. In this part of the task, the historian, unhappily, must usually begin by carefully scrutinizing the most recurrent and crucial terms in his texts, the most prevalent formulas or phrases or sacred words, in order to determine what and how many distinct ideas come to be expressed by or associated with each of these terms in the minds of the various users of it. So that's his, the first part of his method. You've got to figure out the terms and then figure out which, which terms are important, and then figuring out the relations, among, you got to figure out the relations among the different terms. So when this phase, when this first phase is completed, when he has discriminated and listed as exhaustively as he can the separate ruling ideas which distinguish the period or the particular group of writers in it with whom he is concerned, his next task is to examine the relations between these ideas. And the relations he will need to look for are of three kinds, logical, psychological, and historical, and especially under the, and especially under the latter genetic relations. So genetic here is uh, about origins. It's not uh, our uh, recent meaning of genetic having to do with biology. 
So this is how Lovejoy approaches the study of Romanticism. He tries to find out the terms that are important at particular moments of the 18th and 19th centuries and tries to determine their various relations, sort of abstract relations or logical relations, synchronic relations or psychological relations at a particular time, and their diachronic or historical relations, so their developmental, their development through history. It's a very tough method, and it requires, as it requires, tons of reading of both famous and obscure texts. One of the few other masters of this method was M. H. Abrams, who I'll talk about in another video. For now, I want to talk about two of Lovejoy's main ideas about Romanticism. The first is what I call the Mini Romanticisms thesis. The second is what he saw uh, as the main ideas of the of early German Romanticism. So the key ideas of early German Romanticism. These are the two things I'm going to talk about today. So the Mini Romanticisms thesis. Lovejoy's famous essay of 1924 begins with a reference to a satirical text by the French writer Alfred de Musset. In English, the text is called The Letters of Dupuis and Cotonet. It was published in 1936, and it's about the failed attempt by these two guys, uh, Dupuis and Cotonet, to understand what is meant by the word romanticism. They claim to have begun, begun their quest in 1824, a hundred years before Lovejoy's essay of 1924. As I said, Dupuis and Cotonet did not come to any clear conclusion about the meaning of Romanticism, but it's an amusing text to read because of that, because of their efforts. So Lovejoy then begins his own Dupuis and Cotonet-like task of consulting various authorities. So, Regarding the origin of Romanticism, he finds that some say Rousseau is the father of Romanticism, some say Kant, some say Francis Bacon, Bacon. some say Joseph Wharton, some say St. Paul, some say Plato, and so on and so on and so on, back to um, the Garden of Eden. And what about the main characteristics of Romanticism? Can we agree on those? Well, not exactly. Is Romanticism fantastic? Or is it realistic? Is it past-oriented or future-oriented? Is it an illusory perception of the infinite in nature? Or is it the recognition that nature is an illusion? All of these have been claimed by different writers, different researchers. Then there is the psychological emphasis of Romanticism. Is it heart over head? Is it imagination over reason? These are different antitheses, right? They're not quite the same. And what about the preferences, the things that romanticists like? These are others, these are suggestions by many others. I suppose they're not mutually exclusive, um, but some people have said moonlight or red waistcoats, Gothic churches, futurist paintings, talking exclusively about oneself, hero worship, losing oneself in an ecstatic contemplation of nature. So which of these is the key kind of thing that romanticists prefer or do? And then what about the offspring of romanticism? What happened because of romanticism? So these are again kind of oppositions things that seem to be mutually incom incompatible. So the French Revolution and the Oxford Movement. So the Oxford Movement was um, a more conservative kind of movement, not too important here. Uh, the return to Rome or the return to the state of nature. Those are very different returnings. What about the philosophy of Hegel, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche? There are some similarities, but there's also a lot of differences among Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche. What about, um, is it a revival of neo, did it cause a revival, revival of neoplatonic mysticism or transcendentalism or scientific materialism? Is it Wordsworth or Wilde? Very different writers. What about Newman or Huxley? Huxley? Very different kinds of thinkers. 
uh, did it lead to the Waverly novels, the Comédie Humaine, the Les Rogon Macar? If I remember the pron pronunciation of any of these things at this point. So yes, it all, had all these very different kinds of ox, offspring, which seemed to be different, incompatible with each other, at least in important respects. So Lovejoy basically throws up his hands at this and concludes, the word romantic has come to mean so many things that, by itself, it means nothing going on. It is a confusion of terminology and of thought which has for a century been the scandal of literary, literary history and criticism. So this muddly, muddled meaning of the word romanticism. So what can we do? Lovejoy has two proposals about this. First, we can study the processes by which the word romanticism came to have all these different and conflicting associations. Second, we could use the word in its plural form. So we can talk about romanticisms. Lovejoy is arguing that there is no essential romanticism when he says this. There are only things that people have called romantic or labeled as romanticism. We should not expect that all these things will fit together coherently, that they all have what he calls a common denominator. So there's no common denominator, he says, to all these different uses of romanticism. And this has been controversial. In fact, he says the various romanticisms themselves were highly complex and unstable intellectual compounds. The historian of ideas needs to figure out the components of these compounds, the little bits of these intellectual compounds at certain times and compare them with other compounds to see whether there is anything shared among the different romanticisms. So maybe romanticism at one time is a compound of ideas at another time in another place. It's a different compound of ideas. So you need to take apart these different compounds and compare them to see whether or not there is anything similar among all these different kinds of romanticisms. And we'll look at uh, some of this in a moment. Uh, Lovejoy does some of this, some of this work in his essay by comparing the German Romanticism, this first essay that I'm talking about on the discrimination of Romanticisms. So in that essay, he compares the German Romanticism of the 1790s with a Romanticism from earlier in the 18th century. Seems pretty clear, though, that if Romanticism is supposed to refer to something very unique, it's to that movement that began in Germany in the 1790s. In fact, the writers who were part of that movement were the first to call themselves romantic. So most of Lovejoy's own writings on romanticism focus on this period, on the 1790s, and what was intellectually unique about it. So let's look at what Lovejoy thought were the main distinctions of 1790s romanticism, or say early German romanticism. So let's get the a little bit of the context in order. The German Romanticism of the 1790s is called by scholars Early Romanticism or Jena Romanticism. Uh, this is because the writers who were part of it were based in the German city of Jena in the 1790s. The writers included people like um, Ludwig, you have a slide on that. Yeah, the, the writers included people like uh, Ludwig Tieck, um, the Schlegels, August Wilhelm and Friedrich von Schlegel, Novalis, um, Fichte, Schelling, Schleiermacher. So these were kind of the main, the main people at that time. There were others as well. In his 1941 essay on the meaning of Romanticism, so the, the later essay from 1941, Lovejoy analyzes three ideas of this group, this group of writers, that were especially new, important, and influential. The English names, to give the German names also, but um, I'm just going to give the English names here. The English names for the, the ideas that he gives are organicism or holism, dynamism, dynamism or voluntarism, and diversitarianism. So he had already examined 
romantic diversitarianism, the last one, he'd already talked about this a lot in his book, The Great Chain of Being. Let's look at each of these a little bit. So organicism or holism. The idea here is that the whole is primary, the W-H-O-L-E, W-H-O-L-E, is primary. And light, I don't know, it's curious why we spell holism H with an H instead of W-H. It's probably a good, that's probably a stupid question. Um, but the whole is primary. Enlighten, enlightenment philosophers generally understood society as made up of individual individuals coming into relation with each other. So they were separate individuals, and they came into connect, uh, came into relation to form society. Uh, but in the Romantic view, individuals were entities that had become differentiated from a whole. So the whole is first. The society is uh, existing first, and individuals emerge from that. And we're instruments. It followed that we were instruments of that nation or state or community that produced us. So we, ex we exist for its state, its sake. We exist for the sake of the whole. The whole doesn't exist for our sake. We ex exist for the sake of the whole. Then dynamism or uh, voluntarism. This is about the importance of process, striving, becoming, as opposed to static being. It's a dislike of finitude. Endless struggle was an important, con uh, an important concept for the Jena Romantics, actually for many later Romantics as well. This was mostly about individual striving, but there's also a collective or holistic version of this in which the individual is striving through the state or in which the state itself is a kind of insatiable romantic hero as uh, Lovejoy said. And then diversitarianism. So this is important because it reverses a long trend in Western culture. And he spent, this is why he spends so much time on this in uh, The Great Chain of Being. It reverses uh, an important trend in Western culture, which, em which uh, emphasized what is similar among people. So here's what Lovejoy writes. He writes, uh, the general attack upon the differentness of men and their opinions and valuations and institutions this with you know this attack on difference with the resistances to it and the eventual revulsions against it was the central and dominating fact in the intellectual history of Europe from the late 16th to the late 18th century so the attack on difference was the main trend but there was also some resistances to it Talk about the counter enlightenment for example it was thought that there was a kind of ideal type so in this earlier period it was thought that there was a kind of ideal type of human organization and that the actual empirical diversity of peoples and societies involved greater or lesser deviation from this type it was believed in other words that there was a right way of doing things we might disagree about what that is but we understood that there was a single true answer to the question of how best to act. There is a best way to write a drama, or paint a landscape, or build a house, or organize a society. If you consider it from an aesthetic standpoint, this is the idea that the form is most important and the content needs to fit into the form. So this is that earlier idea, pre-romantic idea. But for the Jena Romantics, it came to seem that the diversity of peoples and institutions and societies was natural and desirable and good. There is no best standard way to be human. Aesthetic, aesthetically speaking, content is more important than form. Lovejoy tells us that there were two opposite, or at least very different, I don't know if they're opposite, but they were very different consequences to this privileging of diversity. The first was tolerance and appreciation of diversity, and this seems pretty good. We are still kind of living in this today. The second was the idea that people and societies should cherish, cherish and intensify their difference from others. This is a little bit different. So it's one thing to appreciate diversity and accept it in others, 
It's another thing to intensify difference, your difference from others. In any case, uh, Lovejoy considered the shift from uniformitarianism, what he called the, the idea that there is one best way to do things, one ideal kind of human society, one ideal kind of human. <clears throat> so he considered this shift from uniformitarianism to diversitarianism to be one of the biggest changes of values in human history. And Lovejoy sees these ideas, all these ideas, as having both positive and negative effects. So Lovejoy thought that there were many positive effects in art of taking up these ideas of organicism, dynam dynamism, uh, and diversitarianism. But he was also writing during the Nazis' rise to power in World War II, and so he tended to emphasize more of the negatives. He saw romantic organicism or holism as providing some of the uh, roots for later totalitarianism. And recall that the that organicism views the collective as primary, and the individual is supposed to struggle through and for the collective. The privileging of diversity can intensify to the point where you believe your own differences are the best and everyone should conform to them. He calls this particularistic uniformitarianism. And there was a collective version of romantic dynamism in which the state is always trying to expand itself. You can probably notice, yeah, you can probably notice these ideas in the culture of today. So dynamism is implicit in our interest in self-improvement. Diversitarianism is implicit in our interest in other cultures. And when we tell people to just be yourself. I'm not sure if organicism has a strong presence in mainstream American life, um, in mainstream American life at least, in which the individual, I think in the mainstream, uh, we so, still tend to see the individual as primary. Uh, but fields like sociology and anthropology often have an organicist model of society. And on the political left, on, uh, the po political far left, I should say, not the political left, but the far left and the far right, there are often different kinds of organicist beliefs. Um, the political version is more idealist, while the sociological version is more realist or anti-mechanist. All right, so this was a sketch of Lovejoy's view of Romanticism. He thought there was no essential Romanticism, but rather a variety of Romanticisms. In other words, he had a diversitarian approach to Romanticism rather than a uniformitarian approach. But in the German, uh, but, uh, but in the German Romanticism of the 1790s, there was a common set of ideas, according to Lovejoy, Organicism, dynamism, and diversitarianism. Uh, Lovejoy was a great scholar, but I find, uh, personally, I find that his approach leaves a lot to be desired. Well, we get a good, sense of the, a good sense of the actual ideas. So in Lovejoy, you get a really good sense of the actual ideas, but you don't get a very rich causal picture. So you can see how certain ideas might logically lead to other ideas. What is the actual causal process by which this takes place. Why are some ideas rather than other ideas sticky at particular points in history? To answer these questions, you probably need to get into the biographies of the people involved and the broader social conditions of the time. So anyway, I hope you got something out of this introduction to Lovejoy, this brief introduction to Lovejoy. That's all for now. Thanks for listening and have a great day.